two, one. Hello, everyone, and welcome back to these things that we do called the Super 50 reviews. We did one for week one. It was fantastic. And we're back now for week two. Uh, I'm sorry if you're uh, noticing a very weak uh, part in my voice. You know, it's been a rough couple of days, but for some of our guests on the show, they're very happy. So we're going to let them, you know, get the full platform and some of them will be participating in the tournament tomorrow. I uh, sorry, on Wednesday when, when the knockout stages begin. So hello, Santoki of Guyana and Master of Jamaica. Congratulations for making it into the knockout stages. Yeah, well, I think... I think from my perspective, the Guyanese perspective, it was pretty much straightforward. We were already through when we recorded last time, this time last week. But uh, for my Jamaican colleague, Michelle, against all odds, somehow the Scorpions, they've, they've stung. They've stung Leewards. They've stung Barbados. They're in the semifinals. Michelle, talk to me. You know what? I was tempted to try and do that kind of pretend thing where I was like, yeah, this was always on the cards. We were always going to make the semifinals. But... I'm going to actually be realistic about it. The fact that Jamaica have made the semifinals of this competition, um, kind of like CPL, when the Talawas made the semifinals despite not playing well at really any point in the tournament, um, it speaks to the the lack of quality that that we've seen at times in this tournament. That the Talawas, not Talawas, that the Scorpions can sneak through without even beating Leewards and beating um, Barbados. They didn't even play that. Everyone will say, oh, yeah, but they bowled them out. That means they played well. But given the situations they were in in both games, you have to look at, you both have to look at Leeward Islands and Barbados. And and we need answers, Santoki, as to how those two teams managed to let Jamaica win both those games. Jamaica were 32 for five. <laughs> <laughs> and 87 for eight. <laughs> I still won the match by 51 runs. <laughs> it's, it's, Nikhil, it's, it's Nikhil, Nikhil have, you got, have you got the answers, Nikhil? What happened to Barbados? Just a quick kind of summary. Where did it go wrong for them? Um, to be honest, it's a very hard one to wrap your head around because you're cruising at 140 for two. And I mean, mm. I was there toggling between a basketball game and, and the game. And I said, well, I could, might as well watch the basketball because this one's finished. Then I saw a couple of wickets go down, but I was never worried because I knew we had the likes of, you know, the experienced Jason and all the Ustad Ashinurs, their Rust and Chase as well. But um, I, I, to be honest, I have to give the credit to Andrew McCarthy, six wickets for 16 runs. I, I didn't think he the ball spun that much. I just thought he bowled full. And unfortunately, the, the Barbadian batsmen, they, 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 didn't bat, they didn't apply themselves. I think it changed when Shamar Brooks was run out. But even, even so, I don't even, think, I don't even think Jamaica should have even got to 220. And I, I just want to address something here, guys, because I've heard countless amount of people, you know, people tweet me, people WhatsApp me about Jace Holder's captaincy, and, and that's fair enough, right? No problem. But my, my thing is people ask about, there's two things people are saying that he should have done. One was that they were saying there was, and I saw you tweet about this um, in terms of what Rob Powell did, which was have men at the back. My mm. question is, I, how do people know that would have made a difference? Because the way I see it is that Barretas did not bowl well at these guys. In order for you to bring guys under the bat into play, you have to bowl well. I didn't think Ashley Nurse, who was probably one of the spinners to... Sorry, well, Ashley Nurse, at that time, when those two were batting, he had about four or five overs left. I didn't think he bowled that well that would bring a silly mid on into play, bring a leg slip into play. And then we look at the Pacers, I, you didn't get much. I mean, the second spells, I thought Shamar Hola wasn't good. Uh, and then, so I, I, people, people are addressing the fact that they didn't think the captain put enough pressure by having guys around the bat bowling at the last two periods. But I just didn't think that they bowled well enough. There were a lot of foundry deliveries. And I thought Odin Smith, the way he was hitting the ball, I don't think personally a guy under the bat or two guys under the bat would have made a difference. The second thing, um, in terms of Rustin Chase, well, Darren Ganga said on commentary that he had a niggle. Obviously, Jess Holder didn't come out and say, but I'm not sure. But that could be a reason why he didn't bowl. But that, I just wanted to address those two points because I've heard everybody, literally everyone, and especially from Barbados as well, it's not good. In terms of social media, yeah, it's very, it's very rough. But um, yeah, I don't, I, I don't know if those guys under the bat would have made a huge difference. They, they, you know what? They may not have done. But my argument is this: the minute a team, I was saying it before, I was saying it before we even got to eighty-seven for eight. I was saying it when we were sixty-two for six. I was saying, how comes holders not attacking here? Because remember, the one thing about Jamaica through the whole tournament, they can't bat. They've not batted well once in the entire tournament. People can say that we got to 218, but we still didn't bat well. 
So my argument is, if you're playing a side that can't bat well, put them under all manner of pressure. Make them psychologically think that it's, that it's curtains for them. Don't allow numbers 9, 10 and 11 to get in and then play some kind of rear guard knock. That doesn't make any sense. Even, I, I get your point now, Nikhil. They weren't bowling well. That's true. But sometimes, sometimes with cricket, it's a psychological game. You have to almost do a double bluff and make the batsmen right. believe they're under more pressure than they actually are because there is there is absolutely no excuse to allow in a side to get from 87 to 8 to 218. Absolutely. The, technically the worst side in the tournament. That there's, there's no excuse for it. Yeah, well, um, as I said, you know, obviously Barbados out of the tournament now, so that, <laughs> that's history. But, uh, yeah, I, I said last week on that I thought they would win the tournament. And to be honest, right, guys, if they had got into the if they had got into the semifinals, I think they would have won the tournament. But I guess that's uh, very sad that they that they couldn't manage to get there. But anyways, let's <laughs> let's look at the let's look at the group stages on in terms of the the whole thing, because obviously we would have looked at week one, and now I yeah. want to look at week two because yeah, I, I mean we can always in terms of the best performances, etc. Um, and then let's look at it from a holistic point of view. So tell me, Santoki, I'll start with you. Who, first of all, which performance impressed you uh, this week? I'm sure I'm going to hear Andrew McCarthy from MASH, but let me hear from you. What are we talking, batting or bowling or anything? Any, 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 whichever one. All right, first, firstly, I'll go with batting. I think one guy sort of stood out, Jason Mohammed, um, hit 122 against Barbados. And I think he was 40 not out, 80 not out. So three really good performances in the last week. And we heard Johnny Graves said in the media in the past few days, obviously Super 50 is going to play a big part in selections for the ODI series against Sri Lanka, which will be held on the same pitches. And you've got to think Jason Mohammed with these performances as kind of, he'll definitely get picked for the West Indies side. Um, obviously he was captain in Bangladesh, but as we know, because that was a second string side, there was no guarantees he would be picked for quote unquote, the regular West Indies side. So I think these performances have kind of secured his place and given an opportunity to work his way into the ODI side. And just a very, very composed um, batting performances across across those three games. I was very impressed with him. Nice bat a batsman for you that you were impressed with this week? Batsman? Yeah, tell me about batsman first and then we'll move to the bowler. Okay, cool, cool, cool. I think, I mean, I think Santoki's right in terms of Jason Mohammed. Um, I'm trying to think, do you know what? Hmm. Um, I mean, Jason, Jason Mohammed is the one. I don't think you can really call anybody else. But if I'm looking at West Indies selection, so by the time this comes out, West Indies selection is either would have happened or is probably within 24 hours or something. Mm. I can't believe I'm about to say this, but there is an outside chance. Outside. It's slim, but there's an outside chance that Justin Grease might get in the West Indies or the ice squad. I don't think he will. I don't really? think he will. Wow. But I think there's an outside chance he might make it. I think he's been relatively consistent. Um, no big, big knock that might make him stand out proper, but he has been consistent. In a, in a poor Barbados side, he's been one of the consistent lights in it. So if I, uh, Mohammed's the obvious choice, but if I had to pick someone else, I'd go for Justin Grease. Yeah, um, obviously, Mohammed, the leading run scorer at this point, 285 runs. Um, yeah, Justin Graves, just to address you there, I thought he had a very good... And that's the only positive I could really pick up from this Barbados tournament. Him and Joshua Bishop, because we saw two good young uh, players come through the system. Akeem Jordan was good as well, in my opinion, sometimes. But we know what he was capable of doing for CCC last year. But in terms of the Justin Graves one, I definitely think, you know, even if it's not this series, he's, if he continues to perform like this, he's close. Because I thought he was very consistent. He got the a higher score of 76, which led them to beat the winward. And sorry, just... 220 runs is what he finished with. Uh, and then obviously one more game left for fifth and sixth playoff. But anyways, um, my pick is actually also on the Barbados side. And uh, don't, you know, don't get on me for this, guys, because obviously I do oh, give wait, credit. Wait, wait, wait. There's only two possible players left. <laughs> no, no. Can, I, can, <laughs> can, I just, can I just go? Go on, yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, so I give, obviously I have to give Jason Mohammed credit for scoring the most runs. Uh, obviously Evan Lewis is up there as well. So I could mm. definitely see the two of them being selected. Um, but I, I actually give credit to Shamar Brooks because I'll tell you why, right? Mm. I wouldn't say that the top order for the ODI side, especially looking at something like Bangladesh, was so set. And obviously, you have the Shamar Hetmeyers, the Purans to come back in. But I think Shamar Brooks, obviously, he was unlucky not to get that 100 against the Leewards, which would have made a, a big difference. But I look at his scores. I looked at them 96, 61, 20, and 27. They're all starts. At the 96, he should have probably got the 100. But I thought he applied himself the strike rate. It was... 
92, so it was up there. So I thought he did well, to be honest, in this tournament, and, and he took his opportunity with both hands. So he could be possibly knocking on the door, you know, whether it's now, whether it's in the future for a West Indies place in the ODI team. So that I thought he batted well. In terms of the, I'm sorry, in terms of the bowling now, uh, Mash, you tell me who which bowlers impressed you the most. It's an interesting one because Hayden Walsh is done. He's going to get dropped. Um, uh, I I would be shocked if they if they retain him in the ODI squad uh, for Sri Lanka. Twenty twenty is a different really? game. Well, yeah, I would be shocked. I think he's done. I think I think he's got to go away and work at his game. So that means there is a slot available um, for a spinner, um, or at least maybe even two spinners. I would argue. Um, so I'm going to go for in terms of obviously I know that multi is the leading wicket taker, but I'm not going for multi. Um, I'm going for Imran Khan just because obviously he took five for 32 against, uh, I think it was against Guyana, wasn't it? Um, but Imran Khan didn't start the tournament for Trinidad uh, because they're so loaded with options that he couldn't even make their initial team. But he's only Imran, played three matches, sorry. Yeah, just he's played the last three consecutive. I think basically he's made himself undroppable. So even when, who knows how they're even going to play going forward because they've got so really? many options. But Imran Khan has produced domestically year after year after year after year. He, he, he's always up in amongst the wicket takers. And I think if we're not going to pick Hayden and we're looking for, um, for want of a better word, an unconventional spinner, um, I, he, yes, he's 36 years old, but that doesn't mean anything to me. And I think his spell against Guyana showed what he's like when he's at his best. So I, I'm going to go for Imran Khan. Let me, sorry, Santoki, before you come in, I would like to know, right? I, I'm not sure if Moti will be your pick, but if he is, or even if he isn't, if he goes on to take the most wickets in this tournament, do you look at him, someone like him and, you know, give him the nod for that Sri Lanka series? Or do you say he's too young and he needs more time? You tell me. I would, you know what, I would go with Moti. If Moti was the leading wicket taker, just based on the fact that he's he's come onto the scene, he's made the most of the opportunity. I think his age is irrelevant. I would go I would go with him just based on the merits of being the leading wicket taker in the regional competition, which is what the criteria is for making the West Indies side. Hmm. I think I think to be honest, it's going to be a very interesting side, you know, to see where these guys go. But if we're going based on premise and what it should be, I think the the people who perform in this Super 50 should be given the opportunity in this ODI series upcoming because this is our criteria to pick players. And as you mentioned, the main point there, Masha, these games are going to be played on these same surfaces. So if players are able to do well, replicate and consistency for weeks in this tournament, you would only you would only sense that they will continue to do well for the West Indies. So I think if we go by our policy, which is we pick players off our domestic system, guys like Morty, guys like my pick, who will be Quinton Boatswain. Um, because I thought he had a fantastic tournament. He didn't play every game. He didn't even bowl 10 overs in every game. Uh, 11 wickets. And I thought with his pace, he's not the fastest, but he's very skilled in my opinion. And I thought, I think he could definitely have a future in West Indies cricket. I, he impressed me in the red ball format in the four day. Um, whether they go with him or not, because there's a lot of seamers, that's not really a, a, a problem for the West Indies, is another question. But I think he's doing the right things to be considered. My question to you guys is, I'm looking at the most wickets in this tournament. I see Morty, I see McCarthy, Joshua Bishop, Imran Khan, Larry Edward, Akil Hussain. Why is it? Is it the fact that we can't play spin, that there's so many spinners in this list? Or is it just that the pitches are... But to me, the pitches aren't even turning that much. So what was? What do you all take on it? Santoki, sorry, Masha, you can go first. Um, it's a combination of things. One, I don't, you know, I don't even think it's that we can't play spin. It's that we can't rotate strike. So ordinary spin, ordinary spin can bog a team down because... People just can't even, they can't even pierce the gap for ones and twos regularly. So if I'm, if I'm batting dot after dot after dot, eventually there must be a wicket. Um, there must be a ball with, with my name on it. But also, so there's that, there's that argument. And then the second argument is actually some of the batting in the tournament has been reckless. So to take Joshua Bishop, for example, he is a promising young bowler. I'm not going to deny that. But of the five wickets he took against Jamaica, I'm saying that at least 
four of them were down to reckless batting. And that's where well, that's where your point, Nikhil. It's not like he the ball was spinning outrageously. Even McCarthy's six, the ball weren't spinning outrageously. People were playing down the wrong line, playing for spin that wasn't even that wasn't coming, loose shots. So I, I think also it's about too many batsmen haven't applied themselves properly in the tournament. Look at uh, Hetmeyer. Um, okay, he's got two scores and then three dismissals, which have all been the same, just reckless. And he's supposed to be an international player. So I think there's also that um, aspect of it as well. Yeah, and another one for me, I, I'm sort of surprised. I would love, I mean, I would love to hear your guys' take on it. Nicholas Puran only is averaging 19.5 in this tournament. And he's only had 78 runs. I, I understand he hasn't had a real opportunity to bat. But I'm shocked that he hasn't been, I mean, yes, Jason Mohamed has been extremely consistent at number three. I'm sure he hasn't, and I think that this may come down to just Trinidad's strength and just, you know, being able to chase such low scores. But I'm sure he hasn't batted more in this tournament. And when he has batted, he hasn't really, I mean, he got an 18 and eight balls the other day and then got out uh, against Guyana. So I'm sort of shocked that I haven't really seen that application, you know, that he wants to bat longer and score a lot of runs. So I'm talking, what do you think? Yeah, I think, as you, you put it rightly, coming into um, the Trinidad side, batting lower down, he's not really had a pressure situation, really. He's not had to deal with it, and he's not had to kind of chase a big total. So he's kind of batting with some sort of abandonment. He's, he's not really... If he, if he had to score, for, if he had to put up a, like a 200 chase or something, you'd see a, a lot more application. I think he's kind of... He's missed out by being in such a strong team. He's not really been given the opportunity to kind of spend time at the crease. And uh, just alluding to what... um. Michelle said there as well, um, we, we mentioned in the first week how batting kind of was dominating the tournament, but as the pitches deteriorated, we would see bowling. But I think, as Mash said, the pressure as well is getting to um, batsmen because we're seeing bowlers getting wickets in clusters. In, the, in this past week, we've seen Pollard get five wickets in three overs. McCarthy yesterday getting a hat-trick and six wickets towards the end. Um, Joshua Bishop, Akeem Jordan, Imran Khan all getting five wicket hauls today. Keon Joseph for Guyana hadn't taken a wicket in his whole um, list day career, got four wickets early on against the Windward Islands. So I think we're seeing a lot of pressure and the batsmen at the regional level can't really cope with that. Once one or two wickets go, it's sort of they lose their mental capacity to kind of play out the ball and rotate strike. So I think we are seeing a lot of mental failings within batsmen as well throughout this tournament. Yeah, and to be honest, it's something that concerns me for the Sri Lanka series because I think we're making scoring 350 over cricket look like, you know, a very difficult task. But to be honest, we're, I think we should be at a stage now where that's a, 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 a mediocre score, whereas that's a par score, especially on these pitches, which I thought are very good. So I'm kind of really disappointed. And I, I mean, the Sri Lanka series, I'm sure we're going to do a separate thing on that. I think the team that they go with in the ODI format will be very interesting looking at the, looking at the better performance in this in this list, because you would, as we said before the tournament, we were hoping the West Indies players stood out, but really and truly, it's a lot of the players that are not even in, I know, in the West Indies A setup that are doing so well. So I think it's going to be very interesting, and, and I'm excited to, to see how that goes. I want to ask you guys as we wrap up here. A couple of teams are welcoming back players from well, Masa and Santoki. You'll be more better equipped to tell me on this, but obviously we've heard about first Sami Permal, Ray Marifa. I'm not sure if Jamaica are going to get Blackwood and Bonner into the side. So let's start with Guyana because I, I'm, I think Parmola and Rifa will come back into the side. What do you guys think? Uh, Santoki, you tell me first. Do you think that was going to make a difference? And do you even see them getting in the team, the two of them? Um, Parmol, I don't see him getting into the team, partly because he hasn't played much cricket. He went to Bangladesh. He didn't play in any games, barring a few warm-up matches. And even then, the emphasis was on red ball cricket. So in terms of white ball cricket, I know he played the CPL. But when you've got Moti and Sinclair bowling so economically and taking wickets, I think it would be unfair on the young players to drop them, especially for a semi-final. If Versami comes in for the semi-final and he's not in form, that's it. Guyana don't get a second chance. They're out. So I think the risk of bringing him in for the second for the semi-final when you do have two capable spinners, I don't think they'll take that. Raymond Reifer, I think, could possibly get in just because of that all-round ability. He, Guyana have struggled with the bat, um, particularly lower down the order to put up runs. So I think he's someone who could do that. And then also his bowling as well. He's he's quite a hard bowler to pick, so I can imagine him taking a few wickets on this pitch. Yeah, I agree with that. I agree. I can, I can definitely see Reef getting him, 100%. Um, the, because Fudadin hasn't fired, Persod hasn't fired... The, the, the Guyana top six isn't actually settled properly. So I can see how they'd bring in Reefer lower down the order to shore it up. 
But yeah, I agree with you, Santo. I don't see, I'm not convinced Pomol gets him because I don't see whose place he takes. So I, I don't see it. Yeah, that would be interesting for sure. Um, Marcel, Jamaica, do you know if Nkrumah Bonner and, and Jermaine Blackford are going to be coming back into the front? If they are, well, I can tell you, I think people should look, look at Jamaica in a different light because those two, as they've just shown in Bangladesh, are match winners and they could they could beat anyone on their day, really. Just the two of them. You're missing out John Campbell as well. Oh, yeah, sorry. John Campbell at the top of the order yeah. as well. So, so And that top three to me, top four of Jamaica's struggles. So if John Campbell, Blackford can come back in, shh, I think, wow, well, they have a good chance. So all three are available. Now, if I'm Jamaica, everyone has to come into the team because they haven't put up one score. If the who are you, who are you bringing them in there. for? Um, sorry, tell us when you're done. Both the openers are going. So, um, oh, but he's a wicket keeper. Yeah, Aldean Thomas, that's the problem. So Thomas has to stay because he's a wicket keeper, but he must have to go down to seven or something. Um, so Campbell, Campbell and King would likely open. Um, Morris goes... Oh boy, so Morris goes. I need to think about how this team is 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 set up, you know. Mm. King McCarthy, Powell, Allen. Boy, I don't even know yet. All I know is everyone comes into the same. <laughs> all, I, all I know so far is you start by putting the three in. Although it wouldn't surprise me if Bonner doesn't play, just because he might want a rest. But oh, okay. I, you, you, you start by putting the three in and then work out your team from there. Um <sighs> Somebody important might have to get. I guess you you drop one of the bowlers because Fabian Allen, in fairness, can play the role as, as a actual frontline bowler in the context of Super Fifty. So you can drop one of the bowlers for Fabian Allen, but we'll see. We'll see. I still it still doesn't give us any chance. Trinidad will still clown on us, but that I would make the change anyways. Someone someone tweeted yesterday that Fabian Allen looked like Herath in his prime. Uh, to be honest, but he was bowling well. But I just want to ask you, Marcel, in terms of Rob Paul and Fabian Allen, do you think they've been batting a bit too low down in yes. the order in this tournament? Yeah, and I, 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 I question the Jamaican think tank because when you have a batting order that is massively struggling, uh, that's the person I would drop, sorry, Javel Glenn. So when you have a batting order which has Morris, uh, Thomas, Glenn, and then so you have those three in your top six, and then you have King, Allen, Powell, who are international players. Your international players have to come higher. Whether that's their position playing for the West Indies or not is, is irrelevant. They have to come and take the responsibility. You can't ask, you can't ask Morris and Thomas to be opening when it's clear that uh, it's, it's harsh to say it, but it's, they're not ready. They're not ready to be to, to be taken on that role. So your international players have to, even if it meant you say to Fabian Allen, you know what, you go and pinch it at the top. Your, your, your international players have to take a seniority in that case. Well said. Um, guys, final thing. Uh, last week I said it, you know, we, we made our predictions after seeing one week of the tournament, who we thought would win it. Now we've seen two weeks of the tournament. I think Barbados will win the fifth place game. <laughs> Like, Watch them lose now as well. <laughs> you know, it's, it's actually so funny because last week, Matthew you sat down there and said you were like, when Barbados and Jamaica are in that fifth and sixth game, it's going to be, you know, but I, I can't even wrap my head around it, to be honest. But I guess that's cricket and that's how it goes. And credit to Jamaica. What I want to just mention before we even get to that, Javor Royale, because I thought the Leewards game of this tournament of Jamaica, that Jamaica played, it turned this whole thing around because to fight and put 110 runs up, but for mm. the last two pairs, Odin Smith, another guy that's a fighter. Fabian Allen batted well with the tail, as, uh, even he, him as well. So I think Jamaica, they're, they're definitely fighters. You saw it yesterday when they somehow, I don't know how, Andrew McCarthy got a hat trick. But I, I credit these guys, you know. And you're saying that they'll get rolled up by Trinidad. They should on paper. But this game of cricket is so funny. Anything I think can happen on the day. But anyways, Santoki, I'll go with you first. Is Guyana going to win this tournament? And if not, who? Yeah, Guyana's, this is Guyana's year. I think um, we saw today against the Windward Islands. We saw today against the Windward Islands, the big show, the most talented player in West Indies at the moment, Shimron Hetmeyer. He was warming up. He's getting ready to bring the smoke. Um, but no, I think I think we'll I think we should comfortably beat Windward Islands. I know today a few players were rested from both sides, but I think we, we're stronger than Windward Islands. We'll get to the final. Um, against Trinidad, I think Nar Smith is going to be key. I don't know if Trinidad, if the batsman will be able to cope with him. He seems to be bringing a lot to this tournament. Then you've got Moti and Sinclair who can kind of um, restrict batsmen as well, put pressure on. So Guyana have a very, very good chance. And obviously, 
as a Guyanese, I have to back them. I could never really back uh, Trinidad to win any sort of tournament. <laughs> right, Matt, Matt Santoki, touch on this quickly because obviously they were cruising this week at 110 for one or what was it, 150 for one. And, and they just capitulated. I was, I was so shocked that they just gave it away like that. 187 all up. What happened? I think it's I think it's what we said earlier. So it's been a pattern with a lot of sides. There's just been collapses. They just um Imran Khan once he got a bit of momentum, just tore through the middle order. They panicked. They played reckless shots. Forgot it was a 50 over game, and then sort of just went from there. But um luckily it was a dead rubber game. We were both through, so there was nothing at stake. So hopefully they don't replicate the same sort of behaviour if we get to the final. I don't want to underestimate Windward Islands at this point of the Eva. Mm. Well, Mash, before you get to your team, because I think I know who that would be. Guys, I want to, you know, we, we didn't actually touch on this. Trinidad, I have just, I, I was speaking to some people yesterday. How do they get Darren Bravo and Lendo Simmons back in this side? Who do they drop? I, I can't see, sorry, not Darren Bravo, Lendo Simmons. And I think there was someone else that had to come back in. Uh, but I, I, oh, sorry, Sunil Narayan. But I think he'll come back in for... Um, either Carrie Pierre or Aki Hussein. But how do you get Lendo Simmons back in? Because their batting is, looks strong. Yeah, the, it's, 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 that question sums up their strength in depth. Mm. They, do you know what? I'm Simmons has to come back in, though, because they can't open with Otley. So mm. it, it has to be... If, if Simmons is fit, he has to come back in with Lewis. But what you're then saying, um, Nikhil, is how do they then jig their side lower down the order? And get Kyron he, Pollard back in, because remember, Pollard didn't play in the last so year. Pollard has to come back in. Simmons has to come back in. Narayan has to come back in. So Akil Hussein arguably has to come back in, but Kyrie Pierce, since he's come in, has bowled brilliantly. So mm. Imran Khan is probably not even supposed to be playing, but he's bowled yeah. brilliantly. So who do you even drop? Narayan has to play because against Jamaica, he'll go for like six runs in the 10 overs or something. So he obviously he obviously has to play. So this is, it's an embarrassment of riches. Um, Jaden Seals will obviously drop out. Ravi Rampal will come back in. Uh, but I don't know, you know. The so only way the... I could see is, is if, Dan if Dinesh Ramdin doesn't play and yes, Nicholas exactly. Puran keeps. But the thing yeah. is, Trinidad trusts Ramdin's glove work and he was brilliant yeah. even in that Imran Khan spell. Yeah. He was so good with the gloves. And, and we yeah. know how crucial that position is. Do they have, you know, the guts to drop him? I don't know. That's going to be a very tough one. I would love to. I'm interested to see how they go. That's what I said before the tournament. The only way to fit everyone in was if you took the gloves of Ramdin. But as as you spot on, as you said, Nikhil, Ramdin is the best wicket, actual glove man. When it comes down to glove work, he's the best in the Caribbean. And he, and he, and he showed it against Guyana. And that's why when people cuss Ramdin off, I always think, but look, his glove work is exemplary. Everyone's got to learn off him when it comes to glove work. That's true. I think Joshua De Silva is going to be very soon, you know, up there with him as well. Um, but Mas, so who is going to win the tournament then? I'm I'm surprised Santoki is so confident, to be honest, in terms of <laughs> Guyana. Um, I backed. I said Jamaica would lose against Leeds. I said we'd lose against Barbados. So now I'm going to say that we're going to lose against Trinidad, and <laughs> <laughs> we'll lose against Trinidad, and we'll see what happens. <laughs> to be honest, right? I think that Trinidad's complacency in this tournament. And I mean, when I say complacency, obviously they've won every game. They're not complacent. When I say that, it's just, I just mean, I don't think they've really, you know, as we've said last week, we thought they were playing around. I don't think they've even put out their full strength 11 and batted in the right order, etc. yet. So I don't know if that could come out to bite them. They look extremely strong, but I just think there's such a formidable side and I don't know you never know I'm telling you if Jermaine Blackwood and Kroon Bonner and John Campbell come back into this side I think anything could happen but right now um, since I've been already bashed for my Barbados pick last week I think I'm going to have to go to Trinidad and hope you know well not hope that they win but I think that's the safest pick right now for my reputation I've, I've got one question to end actually sure. um, <laughs> if Trinidad win this tournament and don't lose 21 should we pick Trinidad to represent West Indies in the ODI? Stop. Right, just, know, everyone, stop. From, just stop. What do you reckon? Everyone, one to eleven. Just pick Trinidad. You know what? Just you know what? It sounds. You know what? That sounds. That sounds like an audacious question to ask. But genuinely, if you pick that Trinidad eleven, they would probably win the ODI series against Sri Lanka. No, I, I disagree. I disagree. I don't think. I don't think we pick anybody else from any other island now. <laughs> just pick Shea Hope and Simon Hatmeyer have to get in the side. <laughs> 
But it will be interesting. It will be interesting if you're saying to me, rightly so, Nikhil, that the, the domestic tournament is our criteria for making the ODI squad and we have a one team that goes unbeaten for the whole tournament and no one ever came close to them, then surely the majority of that team has to get selected. Do you open... I know I don't want to get too much into Sri Lanka, guys, because I know we're going to probably do a separate thing. But given the way Landon Simmons has bought in this tournament, obviously, Evan Lewis, you, we hope he's available. He's going to open the batting. Do you open with him or do you open with Shea Hope? Do you open with Landon Simmons or Shea Hope? Nice. No, it's, it's got to be Hope and Lewis for me. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. Sounds okay. Hope and Lewis. Yeah, Hope and Lewis. Hope, does, hope, hope is undroppable in this format. As much as I'm saying the whole Trinidad team, you can't drop Hope in this format. Even sure. I'm not that crazy. No, I think he's our best one day batsman, man. So he has to play. Now he would definitely play, but I just meant if y'all would open with him. So does let well, I guess we're gonna get into selection. Guys, don't I know it's a very exciting um uh, because to be honest, guys, we have to definitely link up for our Sri Lanka preview where even before maybe even before the squads come up, because I think this is gonna be crucial to see. And it'll be good for the future of our cricket as well to see how much they trust in our domestic system. But so I'm talking on my side. Mm-hmm. Started the show by it. I'll congratulate you guys once again for you know making the next stage. Barbados mm-hmm. will be back. You know, don't worry about it. Barbados will be back. We've had a rough year in terms of CPL and now the Super 50, but we'll be back. Yeah, you need you need to take that picture down behind you. Things are. I've got a flag for you though. I've got a Jamaica flag if you want one. You know. <laughs> Things are kind of rough, man, guys. Honestly, it's been a rough couple. It's been a rough day or so, you know. Oh, but anyways, God. guys, appreciate it a lot. I think this is a good review. Guys, the knockout stage is going to be coming up. Let's see who wins the tournament. A lot of this cricket coming up depends uh, with the West Indies, sorry, depends on, on a lot on this cricket coming up. This is where you test the meta and the pressure in these sort of games. So hopefully we get uh, good competitive games and hopefully Barbados can win that fifth place. Uh, playoff as well. Thanks a lot, guys. And yeah, we'll see you all next week. Yeah, cool. Thank you.